Welcome to the Brain Pick a Pro Show, live from Lake Wiley, South Carolina, and halfway across the country, my favorite state. If I could change where I was born, I would change it to Texas. My good friend, Mitch Steven. What's going on, buddy? Man, we're just hanging out down here, and if it's not if it's not burning up hot, it's a flood. So we, <laughs> <laughs> we pray for rain, and then we got to put up signs around town. Whoever is praying for rain, please stop. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you, man. Yeah, and and you. I mean, I love Texas, man. I love Texas. I meant that when I said if I could change where I was from, it would be Texas. I tell everybody that. I just love the whole Texas thing, the attitude, everything. I mean, and, and you are the ultimate Texan. You have what, like a 600 acre ranch or something out there? Yeah, I got a ranch. You got to come down and see me. We'll shoot a hog or something. Man, I would love to. That'd be a lot of fun. That yeah, would... I, got, I, got a, I got a 600 acre ranch. It has all kinds of animals on it, turkeys and deer and quail and dove. And this dove season right now, so we're all walking around with feathers in our truck. <laughs> I hear you, man. I hear you. That's awesome. That's cool. So, uh, Mitch, let's start out and tell everybody a little bit about yourself. I know a lot of people have heard of you. You got a best-selling book out and stuff like that. I mean, you're a full-time real estate investor, you know, able to do pretty much what you want to do now. But tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. You know, I, I was I, I was a late bloomer. I didn't find what I was supposed to do with my life until I was about 36 uh, before that, I tried everything in the world. I had a stack of business cards that I failed at, uh, you know, six inches tall. Um, but I, I, I always had good credit. I always had a good reputation. Even when my businesses would close, I would settle my accounts. Uh, I was determined to figure out what I was going to be good at. And one day I had a place that I lived in that I bought, and I, it was getting kind of small, or I wanted something bigger, so I bought a two-bedroom place. And I leased out my, my one bedroom place. And then I got a roommate with my two in the two bedroom place. And you know, I looked up and I was living for free. Because by the time everyone paid their rent, I didn't I didn't know anything on my two houses. And then and then I sold them and I made more money than I made uh, in two years at my job. Wow. And I thought well, maybe this needs to be looked into. <laughs> so I started reading books like Nothing Down and Robert Allen. It took me a long time though to get the concepts that you could actually function in this business without any money. I mean, there's this right, right, Larry. There's a difference between reading it and owning it in your heart. And That's so I read all about Nothing Down, but I, I still didn't get it. And one day, this guy wanted to sell some a fourplex, and I negotiated that I didn't have to have payments for a year because I didn't have any money. And I figured I tried to figure it out within that year of how to get some money. And uh, so I got it with no money down. And then I used my credit cards to fix up the four units. And I had like, you know, $2,400 a month coming in. This was like 20 years ago. $2,400 a month coming in. And I had 0% credit cards. So I was just using everything I made off them to pay my credit cards. I thought, you know, bam, there's that nothing down deal that, that – Robert Allen was talking about. I just did it. It's like I got to get hit in the head with a baseball bat for the concept before I get it. I'm a slow learner, slow, slow, slow learner. But between um, age 36 and age 56, I I did over 1,500 houses in my town. So once I caught on, I caught on pretty good. But you never stop learning in this business, man. You never stop learning. That's so true, man. That's so true. I, in fact, I was just at a mastermind last week. I'm going to another one uh, the end of this week, and and I'm always buying education, even though I teach this stuff just like you do. We're always learning, aren't we? Man, I, I went to a mastermind with Eddie Speed the other day, and and and, uh, and picked up a piece that just blew my mind. If I'd have known, if I'd have known this, the last fifteen hundred houses, I'd be worth another fortune just by one move that I didn't do. I, I sold a lot of notes in my career, and Eddie showed me how to sell like the front end of the notes and keep the back end. Well, if you sell enough of the front end, you get made whole, just like you sold the complete note or you, right. or you cashed out. But then you still got $102,000 worth of payments owed to you at the end. And I thought, my God, if there was $100,000 owed to me on every note I ever sold in my life, I'd be worth $20 million more than I am right now. There you go. That's exactly I mean, right. $20 million probably. I, I shudder to even think about it. I almost started crying, you know, right there in the middle of the map. I was like, God, what have I done? Can I, I need my life back. 
I love it. I love it. Not that's that it's awesome. been bad. You know, it hasn't been bad at all, but it's like you don't know what you don't know. That's why that's why these shows or these kind of podcasts are invaluable to people, especially people that don't have the money right now to really go to a five or ten or fifteen or twenty or twenty five thousand dollar mastermind. I right. I get it. Yeah. There's a time and a place for it, but that's true. That's true. You just got to work your way up to it. So, so you've thrown out a lot of things there about selling a partial versus selling the whole thing, keeping the tail in and all that. So, so tell everybody a little bit about what it is that you do. Well, I, I, I do, I'll do anything as far as <laughs> any kind of strategy, you know, subject to or flip or sell an assignment of a contract. I'll do whatever the house tells me to do or the situation tells me to do. Right. Because over the years, I've learned all the strategies, but in the beginning, you really need to focus on one strategy and get really good at it. Otherwise, right. you'll just be overwhelmed and scattered. So my main strategy was to buy things with OPM, other people's money, and sell th- and then sell that house for twice as much and carry the note, right. which means I'd ask for a down payment, a substantial down payment, and payments for 30 years fixed, no balloon. And so let's an example. I buy a house for 50 I borrow 52. Why would I borrow? I borrow 2,000 extra. Why? Because it costs about $2,000 to find this half price house. Right, right. Now I do about 100 houses a year, give or take. I'm really close every year, right at 100 in my hometown. And if I leave 200, if I leave 2,000 in every house for the year, I'll leave 200,000 sitting around. In five years, that's a million bucks I've left sitting around. So I, I borrow, always borrow at least an extra 2,000. So now I got fifty-two thousand. I borrow my money at eight percent interest only, five years, non-recourse, collateral only loan. And I, by the way, Larry, I have thirteen million dollars of that from private people. It's amazing what happens when you borrow money and pay them back. They just keep That's giving huge. you twenty-two years. They just keep throwing it at me. They don't want to get um, it back. So now I got this. I got this fifty-two thousand dollar loan from this private lender. And I owe, like, just for easy math, $350 a month. It's really like $342.83, but who's counting? Um, <laughs> and then I go out and I sell it for 100 owner finance with 10000 down. And that guy owes me um, 90000 at 10%. So, see, I'm making 2% off my borrowed money because I borrowed my money 8%. Right. So I'm making 2%, like a 2% $52,000 CD. And then I'm making the whole 10% on the spread between 52 and 90, which is what, $38,000. And I got paid $10,000 to do that, plus I got my $2,000 advertising money back so I can live to advertise another month. And I just do it about every four days. <laughs> uh, and so I, I, so the guy that owes me the 90 at 10% owes me, say, roughly 850 for easy numbers. Right. So 850 minus 350 that I owe is 500. So I got paid ten thousand dollars to create a, a five hundred dollar a month positive cash flow, of which I am not a landlord. If the air conditioner breaks, it's not mine. I don't own the house. Uh, if the toilet leaks, it's not my toilet. Right. So when, the, when that eight hundred and fifty dollar check comes and I pay out my three fifty and I'm left with that five hundred, it's my money because there's no one to call me and say, "Hey, you need to fix the air conditioner." When I used to be a landlord and I used to have that's what I thought, you know, I was going to do with my life was be a landlord. I'd get that money. Sometimes I'd get that money three, four months in a row. But I was scared to death to spend it because if the air conditioner man called me, apparently it was all his money and I'd have to give it to him. Yeah. And I never knew when I was going to get the call. Right, right. You know, I knew one thing for sure. The call was coming. It was just a matter of time. Eventually. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And like you said, the best part of that is no taxes, no insurance, no repairs, no maintenance, no property management. Right. Well, right. I mean, by law now with Dodd Frank, we're supposed to collect the taxes and the insurance in the payment. But that's just a wash. It comes in, it goes out. You know, it's in an escrow account. But, but yeah, that principal and interest differential that I get to keep, it's mine on that day that the check clears. When that, when the, when the bank says that man's check was good, that money's in my bank and it's my money. And so the downside of 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 not being a buy and hold guy. See, I'm a buy and sell guy. The downside is I don't get appreciation and I don't get depreciation. Right. But if you notice in my, you know, and you'll relate to this really big time, Larry. You notice in my example, I bought it for fifty and I sold it for a hundred, 
I mean, how much appreciate? I did that in like 30 days or 60 days. How much appreciation you landlords want? You want to annualize that? You create you know, your like, own. Right, right. So I, I have the depreciation part figured out. I mean, the appreciation part figured out because I, I make my appreciation right now. I buy at steep discounts. My appreciation is figured in. If you buy something for 50 and sell it for 130 days, that's a 100% increase. If you annualize that, that's a 1,200% uh, uh, appreciation rate, you know, so uh, you can scratch the appreciation part off of what you don't get. Right. But there's the depreciation. So, but you're a business owner. You can find other tax uh, strategies and tax loopholes and stack, you know, to, to make up for that depreciation that you don't get. But here's the biggest thing. And this is how I make up on my depreciation. You know, to quote Jack Bosch, you got, you got um, one time cash, you got temporary cash, and you got forever cash. So flipping those houses or selling those contracts or wholesaling, that's all one-time cash because you get paid once and it's over. My strategy of the buy with OPM and sell with owner financing, you get some cash up front and you get payments, but those payments are going to expire because they're <laughs> mortgage payments. They're going right. to end on Sunday. Right, right. So that's temporary cash. So I have to take – I take – the money that I make, the wealth that I build from one-time cash strategies and temporary cash strategies, and I buy, I have to take a third, I have to take a step, an extra step. I have to take that wealth and I have to buy into a forever cash strategy, or else I'll look up in ten years and everything will be expired. Right. Or over. so I buy boat and mini storages, self storage, and those are million-dollar facilities. And now I got my depreciation. There you go. There you go. You know, and I chose a rental vehicle that to me is the simplest in the world. It's a lot easier. I prefer renting 10 by 10 and 10 by 20 squares and 10 by 30 squares to people who don't live in them. They just store their junk in them. I prefer that over renting houses because there's so much more resistance and so much, so more many laws and so more ramifications of kicking someone out. <clears throat> I'm not displacing people's kids or their families or anything. It's all just a bunch of junk. And all that stuff on Storage Wars is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I never found anything in a storage that was worth anything. <laughs> I believe that. I believe that. Because if it's worth anything, if they can't pay their $65 a month rent, they're going to sell whatever's in there. <laughs> right? Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of times it's a conscious decision that they're going to just give up and quit, and they'll go get all their good stuff out. Right, right, right. And then quit making a payment. Or it's happened. You may even you may even be in foreclosure with them, and they just go cut the locks and break the law and steal their own stuff. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that happens. I'm sure that happens. Yeah. yeah. So um, so tell us a little bit about – now, one, one thing, I mean, you raise a lot of money, like you just mentioned earlier – and you said you raise raise it at eight percent interest only payments for five years. You know, a lot of people would say, "Man, that's got to be tough to do." Everybody wants ten or twelve or fifteen. Yeah, well, I had so much ten percent money that I couldn't spend it all. So this is true. Uh, to this day, in two thousand and five, I started a hard money loan business because I couldn't spend all the money they wanted to give me. Right. And, and I learned really quickly that if I didn't get it out. For them, that they would get it out themselves and lose it. Right. About fifty percent of the time, they'd lose it. The other fifty percent of the time, it'd be in a safe place, but I couldn't get to it anymore. Right. You know, it'd already be spoken for. So I decided when people said that 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 they had money to lend, that if I couldn't get it out myself and go buy a house, then I would I would loan it to my competitors who had found exceptional deals before I did. And I would just lean up, you know, I'd get a lien on those houses. If they didn't pay, it was like another way of acquiring houses if they didn't pay because I wanted that house for whatever amount of money I loaned. Right. So today I have about $6 million in, in private money out on the street in loans and about $7 million out in the houses that I bought. And, and so I had so much 10% money that this was becoming a problem. So I just said from now on, Whoever asks if they, whoever wants to play and loan me money, it, the new number is eight. Well, I started getting people to say yes, uh, surprisingly enough. And, right. and, I, and I got more people saying yes than I ever would have thought about. It's amazing when you make up your mind that that's how it's going to be. Right. That's, that's what starts happening. I didn't go back to my 10% people and tell them 8% because I didn't want to do that. Right. You've been gracious enough to loan me money at 10%. I don't want to mess with them. Right. But I, every new person I started saying, I pay eight. 
Well, after a while, I started getting so much 8% that the 10% money said, how come you're not getting my money out? And I said, well, frankly, I've got a lot. Then, then they opened up the conversation. Then right. I say, well, honestly, I got so much 8% money that I have to get out that money first. I mean, look, if you had a business and you had a chance to borrow money at 10 and then you had another bank over there offering you at 8, which one you owe you owe your business the right decision. Now, which right. one's the right decision? Right, right. To do the eight. And I said, okay, so as soon as I finish getting out all this eight, I'll come back around and I'll start putting out 10. Well, I never come back around because I started getting so much eight. And they finally said, okay, I want it out. Just put it out at eight. That's awesome. Everybody, everybody eventually came down to eight because it started to snowball. The more people at 10% came down to eight, the longer it was going to take me to get to the other people at 10%. Right. Pretty soon they all called me. There's only two people that I never moved from 10% to 8%. That's my mom and dad's money and my partner's mom and dad's money. We we get their money out first and we get it out at 10%. Right. That's they really were the good. First ones, they were the first ones ever to loan us a dime to, to, to even begin this business. That's and good, man. Family. You got to so, take care of them. Yeah. So, so Mitch, uh, finding Finding private money is a big deal to a lot of people, right? Because a lot of people, like you said, just getting started, they don't have much money. Where do you find your private money lenders? And and you know, Mitch, I mean, you and I saw each other just a few weeks ago. Man, I saw you in action. I saw you working it. You know, I knew you were raising a lot of money. You probably raised over a million dollars then, didn't you? I raised I raised a million four hundred fifty seven thousand to be exact. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and and there's an art to it. You know, I have a course called Private Money Changes Everything. Uh, I didn't come here to sell that course or anything, but but in that, but but I'll tell you the biggest obstacle is the people's mindset. You remember we just talked about when I made up my mind that the number was eight percent. Right. I didn't even quite believe it, but I went at it full speed, and all of a sudden it started coming true. You have, and then it didn't take but a couple of eight percent people for me to really start believing it in my heart. Right. And then it started to pick up. So the hardest thing for a person to do in private money is overcome their um, their mental block or their mental hurdle that they have with it. There's a lot of them. Um, my partner had a mental block. Uh, he was well. We'll get to that in a second. But there's like. Uh, <clears throat> I don't have experience. I have a bankruptcy. I don't have good credit. Um, I don't know people with money. I'm not a salesman. Uh, it goes on and on. I'm too short. Sure. I'm too fat. Uh, I'm a minority. I don't speak the language well. You know, it goes on and on and on. And my partner's was um, he was he was he thought he was too young. These guys that he said, Mitch, these guys I'm talking to are multimillionaires. They're in their late sixties and early seventies and their eighties. Why in the hell are they going to loan a 27-year-old kid this money? And I said, so now I said, oh, oh, that I said, that's beautiful, Mike. I said, we finally figured out. I just finally figured out what your hurdle is. You think you're too young. And I says, let me tell you, you're giving yourself way too much credit. It's not about you. It's about the deal. Charles Manson should have been able to get this money from prison if he'd have had a phone. Because <laughs> what – when you find a house that you can buy for fifty or sixty thousand, and you're going to give a first lien on a house that's worth a hundred, and if you don't pay them their sixty thousand, they're going to get a house worth a hundred. They don't care who you are. Right. It's not about you. It's about what are they, what happens if you don't pay them, and if that scenario is pretty enough. And so I said, do this. You walk right up to them. You say, look, this is my deal. This is my property. I want to borrow X amount on this house that's worth two X. And look them straight in the eyes and say, now here's the deal. I've got two choices every day of my life. I can pay you the interest rate agreed upon as agreed, or I can hand you the deed to this house. And those are my two choices every day of the, every day of the week. Every day I have those two choices. And if you, don't, if you don't want that house over there, go look at it. If you don't want that house, don't do this deal. Right, right. If you don't want that house for the money I'm asking you to loan. Do not do this deal, and, and so it takes you right out of the picture. It, now the it's, it, the house is what makes the decision for you. Do they want that house for the money they're loaning or not? Right, right. And, and, and if they look at you and say, "Well, how's your credit?" Say, "You know, I, I'm happy to give you my credit, but it doesn't really matter because here's what's going to happen. In the worst case scenario, you're going to get that house. You want that house or you don't want that house? Right. And right. if they say, "Well, I don't really want that house," I say, "Okay, 
then I'll bring I'll wait till another deal when the house appeals to you a little bit more. Now, for the record, I've never given a house back in my career. Never filed bankruptcy, never filed chapter or anything, never gave a deed back in my career. But you have to talk to the lender is the worst thing can happen to him is he's going to get that. Right. And if that's not good enough, then don't do it. And people appreciate the honesty and, and they appreciate the simplicity of it. You know, so your job is to, to, to adequately describe what that house is worth to them so that they believe the value that you're telling them. So you bring them comps or you, you know, bring them real evidence that this is how I arrived at the value of that house. And you can call any realtor you want and they're going to pull up these same comps off the MLS. Right, right. That's, and that's how. That's how um, I get people to change their mindset because so many people think it's about them and it's not about you at all. It's about the collateral. That's so true. I really like what you said. You know, if you wouldn't buy this house at this price, then don't loan the money, right? Because or if you don't think this is an extraordinary value to, you know, you're going to loan me $55,000. I'm saying this house is worth $95,000. If you don't appreciate that, that differential spread, and if you don't think you can mitigate your problems, if you get that house, then don't do this deal. Exactly. Exactly. That's really important. Now you set your you set your private money up for five years, right? Well, that's just that's one of my choices. I can tailor my my like the the only reason why it's like that, and I'll be this is a personal situation. Most of my people that loan me money are in their late seventies or early eighties. You know, I've right. been doing this for twenty two years. When I started, it wasn't that way. And and but older people will tell you. I don't know how long I'm going to live. I don't want my money out for 10 years. I don't want my money out for 15 years. Right. The other thing is, is the older generation is deathly afraid to spend, spend their principal. Right. And so if they send them a principal interest payment, then they got to figure out on every house, how much is the principal, how much is the interest and take the principal down to the bank. And some of them got, you know, loan me on 10 or 15 houses. This is a, this would turn into a job for an 80 year old. You know what I mean? Right, Very right. difficult. So I said, you know, let's just make this simple. You don't want to go long, and you don't want to have to worry about what's principal and what's not. So let me just make it a short note, five years. And if you get a check, a small check, it's interest. It's interest. And if you get that great big check, that's the return of your principal. Right. And it was really easy for them. Now, the younger generation says, I got a 401k or I've got an IRA. I want to invest my money, and I don't want to jack with it for 10 or 15 years because I can't even get to it for 20 years. Right. So I want to make one time deal. And so when I'm talking to younger people, I present amortizing uh, principal interest, long-term payments, especially if they have a retirement account because they can't spend it anyway. So it doesn't matter right. how much is principal and interest. It just all goes into the retirement account. And I've learned to recognize when to, when to, to suggest different payment plans. You know what I mean? Right. It goes right back in there. Yeah. So, you know, I pay seven widows right now. A lot of the, a lot of my lenders, would be into their second decade, but they died, and I'm paying either their estates or their or their widows right now. Yeah, and and I have to take care of them because these these 80 year old widows they don't know anything about. I mean, you just can't give them a problem. They're ill equipped to deal with anything. I just have to take care of it. The house goes blank. I gotta I gotta solve the problem. Right. You know what I mean? I gotta go reload it. I pay them off and take the problem myself or whatever. So. Right. Those people took care of me for a long time. And believe it or not, this is personal history, but every single one of those men that, that passed away, the seven of them, in, in the last three or four years, knew they were going to pass away. And they all called for a private meeting with me, some of them while they were on oxygen in a hospital in, in a bed, and made me promise that I'd take care of their wife when I was gone. And I said, I'll take care of them just like they were my mother. I don't know any other way to do it. I take care of everybody's money the same. My mama's money or your 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 widowed wife's money. It's all the same. Right. You know? And and how I've been successful for such a long time is I never borrow over sixty five percent. Right. And I average fifty eight percent. So if the house is worth a hundred, I average borrowing fifty eight thousand and I will never go over sixty five. If I wanna well, I say if I wanna go over sixty five thousand, I gotta pull the rest of that money out of my pocket. Right. I gotta I keep my private lenders at a very um, uh, very comfortable risk reward uh, level, you know, so that when the economies turn or when there's a recession, um, they got plenty of room. You know, property values in the worst case scenario, 
would have to drop 35% before the house was worth exactly what they have in it. Before they would be just flush. <laughs> yeah, they'd be flush. They'd be, they'd be even. Right. And, and everyone else, if you have a stock certificate or you had some other kind of investment, when it goes down a point, you go down a point. Right. You know, so if it goes down 35 points, you're behind 35% or whatever. Well, the real estate's very forgiving in that way. So uh, I, I kind of, I, I, I've been policing myself for 22 years, making sure that we don't, <clears throat> at the time of the loan, it's, it's no no more than 65% LTV. That's really good. I love that, Mitch. That's really, really good. You're protecting your lender, even though you know, you're know you in a you're in a situation, you've been doing this long enough, if a deal went south, you could just cut them a check. But you're making sure that you protect your lender, and that's very, very important. And what everybody listening should remember, make sure you always protect your lender because that's your reputation. Right. Yeah, and that's 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 the way. That's your. That's how you come back, or that's how you get out of a home. I, mean, I could go broke tomorrow, and if I if I had, you know, I protect my reputation like that, I can come back in a heartbeat because you know. In, in, in the worst case scenario, the very worst cataclysmic case, someone drops a dirty atomic bomb in downtown San Antonio. I, I give everyone their deeds back and say, you know. Who would have guessed? But they can't blame Mitch Steven for that. You know, and they can't right. say he's a scoundrel, you know, because right. that was the rules. There's a reason why you make eight and ten percent. You share in that tiny bit of that risk. Right. You know what I mean? But you make but it that, painless for them. Yeah. So short of an atomic bomb, I don't know when those little Walmart houses aren't worth money. Right. I don't know when that happened. The day that those little Walmart houses aren't worth money is the day that we're picking up guns and going someplace and your money ain't worth anything anyway. That's exactly right. And the market you're in, which is really kind of the affordable housing type market, not the real low stuff like like I teach and preach and do, but you know, that price range house house is not susceptible to market fluctuations near as much as the higher stuff, right? Right. So so I'm searching from the 250 um, price range 250,000 down, but I'm buying houses generally in owner financing them, generally in the um, 150,000 and down. Right. Because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to exchange the rent payment for a mortgage payment, principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. Right. So the only way that works out is in the medium price range house or the lower medium. Right. I used to deal in the bottom, but there's a lot of, you know, it, when you owner finance at the bottom, they're in and out more often. So there's more work. If you get right. up off the floor a little bit to where, you know, they owe you a hundred grand, those those working folks takes a little more than just a bump in the road for them to get behind. Right. You know? Right. Do many of them refinance and pay you off? <laughs> you know, that's a very interesting topic, and this is what I'll tell you. Um, I'm in the. You have to make up your mind if you're going to do the owner finance strategy. You have to make up your mind. Are you in the owner financing game, or do you want to cash people out? Because let me tell you what. You don't make up your mind. You're going to get your mind made up for you. Right. Because I used to, I used to want to be the owner of finance, and then I get them owner of finance, and then I go out there and try to get them to refi. Right. Well, guess what happens when they refi? First thing happened is they sent out an inspector, and I sold these houses as is. Right. Right. And the inspector comes back with 50 pages of crap that just sounds horrible. It's it's not nearly as bad as they say most of the time, but it's horrible. Right. And they want to walk away. Bad. Then they send out an appraiser, and heaven forbid it be a, a VA appraiser. Then right. they send out an appraiser, and the appraiser informs them that I sold them the house 10 or 15% over the market. And now I'm an asshole. Right. You know, they were fine for four years. I tried to get them refinanced, and I end up being an asshole in their eyes. When they, they couldn't have afforded a house any other way. Right. And, you know, uh, it's all good. But so when people tell me, yeah, we're going to owner finance this house from you, Mitch, but we're going to go ahead and refi you in a year or two. I tell them, you're with the wrong guy. Move along. I'm not looking for people to refi. Right. I want my 30 years worth of payments. That's what my game is. I right. want my interest payments. Now, can I stop somebody? No. But, um, and I get paid off all the time, and that's one of the things with the temporary cash that we, you, you, you may have a 30-year note, but you know as well as I do, Larry, those notes will not last 30 years. They'll be lucky to last seven and a half to 10 years. Right, right. People refinance, they sell, they die, they move out. They you know, win they the default. lottery, they get an inheritance, something happens, they pay off. Right, right. Or, or you know, they move out and you reload it. 
Yeah, well, in, 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 uh, that's another way to recapture some of that lost appreciation because on the, on the small amount of houses that I do have to foreclose on, um, I recapture that ec the, the, new, the new price value is in, and I recapture that equity that I lost as an owner financier. Right, right. About how much down payment do you usually try, <clears throat> do you usually require? 5, 10, 15, 20%? This is a, uh, during the last recession, I learned a lot. I learned that the owner finance strategy booms in a recession. I was buying yeah. a house a day for 45 days in a row until I scared myself. But one of the one of the things I also learned was during that recession, a lot of people I had to foreclose on. Out right. of 275, 80 houses, I had to foreclose on uh, 45 houses. Wow. And I learned uh, that people that have small down payments don't stick as hard. You know, right. I noticed the ones that were flipping out on me didn't have a large investment. Right. So I started changing my tactics to require at least 10% down, and I average 12% now. A lot of that's because of a software called Livecom, L-I-V-E-C-O-M-M.com, where um, I capture the incoming caller's phone numbers to all my houses. So, like, right now I have 8,386 people who have called my owner finance signs. And every time I have a new house, I can hit those people right between the eyes for like two cents a person. Right. And so now I get multiple offers on my houses, and I'm able to choose, you know, most likely who has the biggest down payment. I don't always choose the person with the biggest down payment, um, but I'm getting a lot more offers. And within those offers, <coughs> people that have large down payments is people that don't. And now it's just between which big down payment do I want? And so I right. then I start looking at the people, the character of the people. Right. So Mitch, you, you've you've got a lot going on there, man. You're doing a lot of deals. Where where, where do you find most of your deals? Um, I have act. You know, I I you know, you and I were in a mastermind where we met, right, uh, up in Tampa, and um, that's where I learned to systematize because I had tried to systematize four or five times before by myself and had failed miserably. And I was getting so tired of wearing all the hats and so wore out. And my wealth was such that I didn't have to do it anymore. And I, my legs started, my knees started to give out in the business. You know, I was like, I can't, I don't want to do this anymore. And then I thought to myself, but it's such a great business. If I could only get someone to do some of this for me. Well, I went to the mastermind and they taught me how to do it. And within that systematization, I learned how to hire acquisition managers because part of my business is finding the deals and signing them up. Sure. That's one little piece. So in that process, I learned to find acquisition managers and I have um, four acquisition managers now and it, every one of them has a separate lane. If, if this one's working the tax liens or the nuisance and abatement, then no one else is working that lane. Okay. Right. Cause I don't want to be competing against myself. So right. then I start opening up lanes. Like, I could easily get someone to say, I'm going to open up a virtual wholesaling lane or a virtual owner financing lane. I could get a guy who I felt like was capable, and I could tell him, go order Larry Goins' course, study it for two weeks, get him as your mentor, I'll pay for it, and we're opening up this lane all across the nation or all across right. the states that Larry says. Right. And I could open up that lane. Or I could get someone else's course and, teach, and have someone learn that, and we'd open up that lane. Well, I've got... I got all these different lanes open and, and, and every person is, is confined to their lane, but there's more than enough leads in within that lane. Like um, we got the guy that uh, I send out postcards all the time and I get return postcards. Well, I divide up all the return postcards. You know, if I get up 200 return postcards, I get 50 to this guy, 50 to that guy, follow up, you know, right. um, and they're on a spreadsheet and all those postcards are numbered and we have, you know, a meeting once every two weeks. Where are you at on postcard number 158? Right. You know? Did you find this guy yet? Um, so finding the houses is, is all over the place, but mostly right now it has to do with cold calling. One guy has opened up a phone room with two Filipino VAs, and those VAs call 250 people a day. That's huge. That's huge. Yeah, but, he, but that guy, the reason why I hired that guy was – he was in the credit card collection business, the debt collection business for 10 years. And he was in a phone room calling people every day. And he knew how to do it. And I thought, he came to me, he says, I want to work for you. And I said, yeah. He says, well, what do you want to do? He says, 
I want to open up, would a telephone room help you? And I said, I don't know. Let's open it up and try. Well, it's probably the most lucrative form right now of finding houses. That's great, That's man. Great. I love it. I love it. What kind of list are you calling? Every, you know, there's 30,000 people behind in taxes. So we then we have a VA that just calls for us. That's our sifter. We have a VA in the Philippines that just sifts for us. Get rid of the houses that don't have a potential for profit. Bring me back the 15,000 most likely profitable houses. Right. And we'll start calling on those because I don't need to call on houses that owe more than, you know, that owe more than they're worth. You know exactly. what I mean? Exactly. I mean, you can still make money on a lot of those, but that's not my forte. You know what I mean? Right. Now, you, you mentioned, Mitch, that uh, you, you have four acquisition managers. Well, what does the rest of your team look like? Okay, so um, then I got disposition or sales, right? And I pay based on, I pay 25% of the down payment up to 3% of the sales price. That doesn't mean that if I, if they sell a house for 100000 and they bring me a $30,000 down payment, that I have to limit them to 3000 but that's the rule. Right. But I decide when the bonus goes out, you know what I mean? Right. And I certainly always bonus someone when they get lucky and get a thirty thousand, a thirty percent down payment. That's right. worth to me. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, um, my my salespeople make over a hundred thousand dollars a year. My biggest problem is is that they used to make thirty or forty thousand dollars a year, and they make such good money that they start to sit down, and I have to threaten them that they have to get out of their chair. I don't care how much money you've made. I still got houses to sell. If you want to keep making a hundred thousand dollars a year. You know, get out of that chair, and if you don't, then just keep sitting there, and I'll find someone else. There you go. What about your acquisition people? How you pay them? I pay them thirty-five uh, percent of the net profit, or if I want to, if I want to hold the house myself, we just work out it. Uh, if I buy this house right now and pay you right now, how much we, how much, what's a fair thing? We we work it out. Right. I hate it that that's kind of gray, but. Um, there's no other way to do it. When I want to hold a house, we have to look at what he would make if we flipped it. Sure. We have to work something out. Sure. But the thing about it is, is my paychecks, like you say, yes, I'm going in the other room, getting the check, signing it and handing it to you. So that's part of what helps my negotiation side a little bit, but I'm not trying to out negotiate my acquisition managers. The point is I, I need to be really fair with them because they're, they're the reason why I have not seen the last 300 houses I bought. And I have not talked to the last 300 people that bought my houses. It's because of that mastermind I went to and the people they taught me to hire. And I got to be fair to those people. You know what I mean? Exactly. And if we can't come to an agreement, then we'll just wholesale it or retail it. And the split's obvious then. 35% of the net profit. Right. 35% if they found the lead themselves. And I pay them 25% if they're using my lead source, like my postcards. They get it, got it off of my. Or if I, if a realtor called me that I've known for 20 years and I hand it to them, then they get 25%. Right. That's really good. That's really good. Now, do you I give any of your people? Well. Do you give I any of your people very, a piece of the monthly? No, yeah. I, because I'd be tied to these people for years and years and years and years. Yeah. And I'll be doing 100% of the work long after they're gone. So whenever I do um, owner finance deals, the only time I do that. With a partner is if we formed an LLC and we're going for the long haul. Right, that's a really good point. But let me let me let me make a, a, an interesting point about I, what I learned when I was hiring people. I, I was always getting people that were interested in real estate, and they always wanted to be me. And they were always like doing their job, but they wanted to be me. Right. And I learned to quit going to the real estate schools or going to the clubs and finding people to work with me. I, now I, I find a headhunter business that does sales and I'm looking for a salesman and this is what the salesman needs to do and, and this is what I'm looking for him to do and I want them to test and I want them to test a that they're um very responsible that they're very honest and they have integrity that they show up on time they're punctual I want them to be um I want them to be uh, money motivated I want them to be uh, uh, but then I need them to be bad money managers and I need them to test that they don't have one entrepreneurial bone in their body. And right. that's the guy I'm going to hire. It ends up being engineers and all these different kinds of people that I thought I would never hire. I mean, I didn't, if I would have never hired him in a million years, but the test said, hire him. That's what you're, you asked for this kind of guy. There he is right there. So I said, the one guy that does the best in the, in the acquisitions is an engineer. I never would have picked him. I can hardly get two words out of him. Wow. 
That's that's amazing. That's crazy. Because we've always looked for people that have sales experience, like a telemarketer or in-home sales experience, selling home improvements or or security systems or something like well, that. Most most of the time, the other three guys are that guy. Right. But the test said that this guy was also uh, weighted heavily enough that you that he'd fit in there. I, I actually took him just to see what would happen. Uh, he ends up being my best guy because you know why? He's an engineer. Everything's methodical. Step yeah. one, step two. Black step and white. He follows, he follows the steps, and, it, and, and if you follow the steps, you win You know it's, more than you lose. It's all black and white. Yeah, for him, black and white. That's good, man. No emotion in the offer. He has no emotion. Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. I got one more question I want to ask you, and then uh, if you want to give out something or sell your book or whatever you want to do, I know you got several books out now, but uh, how about servicing? Do you service all your loans in-house? Well, I used to, but then there became a little conflict. You see, if I'm owner of finance in the house, and then Dodd-Frank came out, it regulated my, my, my APR, regulated my interest rate. Right. If I'm, if I'm, if I'm collecting P-I-T-I-S, uh, principal interest taxes insurance and servicing fee if that's going directly in my pocket it was affecting my apr they were counting it as income to right me. okay so i had to sub it out to a to a, another company i use moat note servicing uh moat note servicing.com because i i get them to pay for the servicing but uh -huh. i can't service it myself because it, it screws with my interest rate and i it is, i either have to lower my interest rate or i have to push uh or I'm going to go over the limit by the by the powers that be, the regulating people. Right. So I decided just to, to just to be satisfied with getting the servicing done for free. You know, I made them pay for the servicing that I'm getting. That's really good. I know a lot of a lot of people do that do that, or some people do that. Some people don't, but it's a way just to get a little bit more money, you know, in your monthly payment, and just have your buyer take care of it. It's, I call it PITIS. So it's PITI, Principal Interest Taxes and Insurance, and PITIS is Principal Interest Taxes, Insurance, and Servicing Fee, and it, it, it's it, 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 at worst, you have to start off with a servicing fee in there, and it's just all negotiable. My servicing fee right. is $35 a month. If they get to where they can't afford it or they didn't like it, then we just have a negotiation about it, but it's part of that negotiation that wears them down, so I'm still getting my price or I'm still getting my down payment. It's just another chip. And if I if I can only get twenty dollars for servicing fees, then I just get twenty. But it's better than me paying the whole thirty five. But ninety nine times out of ten, I get the whole the whole servicing fee in addition to what I want. So that's awesome, man. I love it. I love it. So how could somebody reach out to you if they wanted to, you know, uh, get in touch with you or get some of your training or buy your book? I know you got a book, My Life in a Thousand Houses, and then My Life in a Thousand Houses about finding deals, 200 way plus ways to find deals. And, and yeah. you have another one too, just came out. Well, I, it's, I just look at it like my life in a thousand houses series. And then there's failing forward to financial freedom, which is, I want to offer uh, all the listeners, the first 100 pages of that book for free. It's a story about how a dumbass figured out how to make some money, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just kept running right into trees and stuff. Just bam, just it's a story about falling down and getting back up and keep morphing and changing until it finally starts to work. Uh, I'll give you the first 100 pages of that. Just go to 1000houses.com. That's 1000houses.com forward slash free. And there, actually, there's a whole bunch of free stuff on that page, webinars, uh, all kinds of free stuff. Um, you can listen into one of the recorded coaching calls to see if that might interest you, but Go there and get that first 100 pages, learn a little bit more about me and the business I'm in and see if we're a good fit. Um, I'm not very hard to find. You can Google my name. The only problem is my last name is Stephen. No V in the middle and no S on the end. So uh, then my second book was My Life in a Thousand Houses, 200 plus ways to find bargain properties. And my third book was My Life in a Thousand Houses, uh, The Art of Owner Financing. And my fourth book is about to come out, My Life in a Thousand Houses, um, more more uh, stories from a serial house flipper. So <laughs> random thoughts and stories of a serial house flipper. And how that came to be is, you know this for sure, Larry. There are things that happen to us in this business that we can't make up. We're right. not even smart enough to make it. <laughs> right, right, Those right. Those stories I'm putting up telling. Like, I said, man, that's incredible that this could happen. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> 
That's awesome. So the last thing, Mitch, is, you know, I, I don't know if you, uh, you, I hope you don't mind me sharing this with people, but you're also a singer-songwriter. No, I'm not a singer, but I'm a songwriter. Well, you don't want to hear me sing. Hey, I, I heard you sing. You know, see, I don't sing because of my throat. Every time I do, someone threatens to cut it, right? <laughs> 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 that's funny man i haven't heard that one I, i've been around a long time i haven't heard that one that's good i've been saying that for years uh, but you have written some really good songs yeah if you're interested in that it's my hobby uh, there's over 100 songs written or co-written at mitchstevenmusic.com um you know i don't i don't know why i do it i just i've been doing it since i was in the sixth grade and uh it's i've grown gotten better and better over the years but i'm hoping to get really good at it any day now after 40 years i'm <laughs> I'll get good at it any day now. Um, and you you play guitar and write too, don't you? I do play guitar. I do play <laughs> guitar. I got a I got one here in the office. I'll show you. That I actually built this guitar. You built it? I built it. <laughs> yeah. Well that doesn't look like a country guitar. <laughs> no, that now that one isn't. That one isn't. Here's some pictures of me with uh Gene Simmons and Lita Ford and Sebastian Bach playing on stage. Man, that's incredible. I played the drums for 22 years. Did you really? Yeah, in the previous life. That's and, awesome. Uh, I love you know, it. I, I, I used to be really kind of aggravated that I couldn't sing and perform very well, but then I learned a very valuable lesson in real estate and systematization. If I was a great singer and a great performer, I would have to work every Friday and Saturday of my life. Yeah. So being a songwriter works out perfect because you yeah. just write the song and you send it off and then you just go about your business and turn on the radio. And there it is. There it is. <laughs> That's awesome, man. <laughs> hey, I really, really appreciate you doing this. This has been a lot of fun. Hey, I appreciate it too. And you, you actually uh, uh, asked some really great questions. You know, I, sometimes I get tired of answering the same questions over and over. You ask some really interesting questions. It's, it's, it's uh, nice and refreshing. Well, it was not scripted. It was all made up. We just, you know... We just winged it, right? Imagine Mitch Steven and Larry Goins winging it. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. I know, right? Imagine. And man, I want to, I want to come out and go, uh, go hunt some hogs. All right, you're invited anytime you want to. Just call me and give me a heads up. I, I'm spur of the moment too. So if you just say, you know, this weekend, I want to try me out, test me. If I'm, if I can do it, I'll do it. That's awesome, man. I you love it. I'm gonna send you a little video of my ranch. It's it's coming along. I've owned it for two and a half years now. When I got it, it was a POS, and slowly but surely, it's turning into a place that anybody would be proud to go out and spend the weekend on. That's great, man. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. It's been a wealth of information. Well, I appreciate you having me. Thanks a lot. Thanks, man.